Hi everyone and um, thank you for your patience. We had a couple of technical issues to deal with but we'll get started to um, now. So welcome to this month's EMBL ABR webinar which will be about CYVERS, um, Extensible Cyber Infrastructure for Life Science. My name's Pip Griffin from the EMBL Australia Bioinformatics Resource, EMBL ABR for short, and I'm your host for today. My colleagues, Susanna Sabine from ARDC, um, formerly ANS Nature and RDS, and Christina Hall from EMBL ABR are behind the scenes co-hosting the webinar with me. So EMBL ABR is a distributed national research infrastructure network providing bioinformatics support to life science researchers in Australia. It was set up as a collaboration with the European Bioinformatics Institute, EMBL EBI, to maximise Australia's bioinformatics capability. And our 13 nodes around Australia each undertake or support bioinformatics research around the key areas of data, tools, compute, training, standards and platforms. So before we get started, um, I'd like to mention a couple of housekeeping things. The attendees' microphones will be muted during the presentation to minimise background noise. So if you have a question, please type it into the question box. We'll look at these questions at the end of the presentation and relay them to Jason, the speaker. Um, the broadcast is being recorded and it will be made available on the EMBL ABR YouTube channel and we'll notify you by email when it's available. Um, today we're very excited to have Jason Williams speaking to us. So Jason is Education, Training and Outreach Lead for Cyverse and Assistant Director of External Collaborations at um, Cold Spring Harbour Laboratory, the DNA Learning Centre. Jason organises, instructs and, and speaks at a variety of bioinformatics related workshops, conferences and meetings annually. He also serves in an advisory capacity on a variety of bioinformatics and open science projects, including service as the chair of the International Science Advisory Board for EMBL Australia Bioinformatics Resource. Jason also serves on the external panel of consultants to the National Institutes of Health Data Commons Initiative and the NIH's National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute's Data Stage or Storage Toolspace Access and Analytics for Big Data Empowerment. He's an active software and data carpentry instructor and a former chair of the Software Carpentry Foundation and um, Jason also teaches at the Yeshiva University High School for Girls. So today in this webinar we'll explore the key features of Cyverse, having a look at the discovery environment, the data store, atmosphere and some of the approaches available in the visual and interactive computing environment. So over to Jason now. Okay, and thank you, uh, Pip and uh, Susanna and everyone else who uh, organized and invited this. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, excellent. And uh, thank you again to everybody uh, listening on. I'll do my best over uh, the next uh, period of time that we have here to show you a little bit about the Cybers project uh, and hopefully uh, get you uh, excited about the potential that the project has currently and also uh, in, the, in the role that we have uh, here at EMBL ABR uh, being connected to the project in, in, in such a way. Uh, we're certainly looking to see what solutions might exist within Cybers that would be useful to Australian researchers in doing their science. Uh, so I'm going to quickly give you a little bit of background, I have a few slides, and then take you into just some hands-on demos that will uh, give you a little bit of an idea of the project uh, such as it exists. Uh, okay, so uh, we do call this an extensible cyber infrastructure for life science. It's actually um, been around for more than 10 years now, and I'll give you a little bit of the history, but in, in some sense, uh, we're very proud of what we built, and in some sense, it's, it's a quite a mature infrastructure that has been built in response to a lot of the common problems that life scientists has as we sort of entered the, the age of powered by a big data genomics. Uh, so our mission is to transform science through data-driven discovery. Uh, we have right now more than 60,000 registered users, uh, we have petabytes of user data uh, that runs across our network and uh, have definitely contributed to hundreds of publications, uh, courses, discoveries uh, that our users are able to undertake because of the use of the infrastructure. Uh, the infrastructure started back in 2006 as an idea. Um, at that point in time, uh, 
the National Science Foundation, which is our primary uh, funder, uh, sort of anticipated that there'd be need uh, for uh, big data science. Uh, and they sponsored a call and different communities applied for that. And it was actually the plant community that submitted the winning proposal that gave rise to what Cybers was today. So that was funded in 2008 specifically as a project uh, to support plant biology. Uh, the first tools were launched in 2010. Uh, the project was successful enough to be renewed in 2013, and at that time we started broadening out because very little of what we bought was, uh, we, very little of what we constructed was uh, species specific, it's rather species agnostic, so it's uh, applicable to all the life sciences. Uh, we continued on with a rebranding in 2016, and we're also happy to announce uh, just a few months ago renewal of our funding in uh, uh, this year, uh, so that goes on for yet another uh, five years. Uh, this is funded by the National Science Foundation, which uh, is the primary funder of the basic research sciences in the United States. And it's more than $100 million in investment that's really freely available to the community, including the international community, uh, since we're giving this uh, webinar live from Australia. Uh, really, we do ask that people cite when they use it, um, but we really try to uh, create a space where science can be done with as uh, few restrictions as possible. Uh, we use the term cyber infrastructure. I think it might be familiar, may not be, but certainly the components of cyber infrastructure are familiar to most of us. Data storage, software, high performance uh, computing, and also, and especially I would say people. Uh, it's because you have access to all of those uh, sort of set up in the right way that you can solve challenges that otherwise you wouldn't be able to tackle. Um, practically speaking, that means access to platforms, tools, and data sets. Uh, storage and compute, as well as training and support. Um, it's another take-home message, but we want to emphasize that Cybers is really built for data. So uh, no matter what the data type, you really uh, have uh, many different ways that you can think about leveraging the platform to accomplish your science. This uh, sort of layer cake diagram gives you an idea of the various capabilities that are available without the, uh, throughout the Cybers product stack. On the very bottom are the foundational services. Uh, so we do have our own store, uh, storage servers, uh, high performance and cloud systems. And it really is flexible, depends on you as the user. So if you are more on the DevOps, uh, systems engineer, biometrician, uh, you don't have to use any of our interfaces. You may want access directly to things via the API, and you do have the ability to have some low-level low access to that uh, that's, uh, context. But most of us, myself included, who are uh, more on the biology side, uh, might operate on that surface layer of uh, products. And we'll go into some of those and I have the chance to show just a few of them, give you a little bit of an orientation, and I'll talk about uh, how would you use them further if you wanted to. Um, one key thing uh, that's not on here as, as an obvious thing is certainly the data storage. And we'll talk a little bit about that because what we've really created is a place where people can upload uh, essentially very, very large uh, data sets and share them with a, a pretty, uh, uh, low barrier to entry. Uh, the priorities that shape this definitely in genomic space uh, are things that you'd expect. This was true 10 years ago and it's still true now. Uh, assemblies, RNA-seq of various different types, uh, looking at variation, uh, all of those different things are really parts of it, but it's not exclusively genomics. There are certainly uh, other areas where people are working in geospatial data, uh, working in imaging and phenotyping, although I think my examples today will be uh, quite focused on genomics. Uh, the other thing is that uh, Cyverse is a virtual organization. So we are a collaboration of a number of institutions, University of Arizona, which leads, as well as Texas Defense and Computing Center, which is part of the uh, University of Texas, Austin. And I'm at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York, and we also have collaborators at UNC Wilmington. Additionally, uh, there is Cyverse UK, which is an official and a funded project. That's a collaboration between uh, different uh, institutions and funded by BBSRC. Uh, and again, uh, definitely we are interested in uh, collaboration on all scales, and that's, that's an example of that. Okay, uh, so that's enough of the history. Uh, let me try to give you a little bit of an overview of the pieces and the components of the infrastructure and how they relate together. Uh, Cybers products, we like to think of ourselves as Lego bricks, uh, where we have built uh, a lot of the pieces that you may need, uh, almost every uh, analysis in bioinformatics, that last 10% uh, is custom, uh, but much of it uh, that goes ahead of that is shared, and so we've, we've built with that idea of you being able to customize things. Here are some of the major components. 
Uh, so the first one, of course, foundational is the data store. Uh, so you have, as a user, an, an initial 100 gigabyte allocation. You won't see uh, sort of a, a red bar over your name as that gets filled up. Uh, it's a soft limit, um, but uh, we do have a generous amount of st storage space that's available. Uh, if you need up to 10 terabytes, uh, then usually you have that without uh, too much uh, hassle. And then as you need larger allocations, then we will uh, have uh, some uh, documentation. Uh, I will say about this and some other services, especially Atmosphere, uh, that there are some restrictions when it comes to international usage. We try not to, to let those get in the way of uh, good collaboration and science. So if you do run into barriers, uh, always talk to us and we'll do everything we can to make sure that we are making it as easy as possible for everyone to use. Uh, the data store in particular, the data are automatically backed up and we've made it really easy to upload, download, and share, and I'll demonstrate that. Uh, in the first demo I'll do in this webinar. The Discovery Environment is a web platform. Uh, so this is created with the idea that many bi biologists uh, don't know or don't have very much uh, skill at the command line. That's still the case, was when we started, and it's gotten better, but still the case. And so this is a web application that allows you really to run almost any other bioinformatics program that you would at the command line, uh, but it's integrated with our data and high performance computing. So again, it doesn't matter what resources locally you have, Everything is being run on the cyber system, so you don't have to worry about scaling. These are extensible, which means you can add your own applications, and I'll be talking about that in our latest rollout uh, of, a, of a product we call Vice, and I'll give a quick demo of that uh, during the webinar. Atmosphere is our cloud system, and you have access there through hundreds of virtual machine images. You can fully customize your software setup, and it's integrated with our cyber computing and data resources as well. And I hope you see the theme here that all of these different and diverse pro, uh, products are all built uh, to work together. So uh, they play nicely, data transfer works nicely, authorization, authentication works nicely, rather than having all of these different things spread out across uh, multiple different systems from multiple different groups. Uh, science APIs is not something I'll show in the webinar, um, but if you are on the level of working with APIs, uh, you can directly uh, customize and consume cyber resources uh, in a flexible fashion. DNA Subway is also something I won't have to uh, time this uh, webinar to show, but particularly in my uh, institution at the Learning Center, uh, we have a whole bunch of tools dedicated to classroom bioinformatics, uh, and most of the time also paired with wet lab, so that students uh, are really hooked on biological problems and then provide an easy way to solve them using bioinformatics. BISC also uh, is, a, is an example of uh, an image system working with uh, hundreds of different types of images from microscopic to macroscopic, uh, custom APIs, and it's great if you're working with any type of phenotyping challenge where you have uh, hundreds, thousands, millions of images that you need to store, organize, share, analyze. Okay, so uh, in this next section, which is what I'll spend the rest of my time on, I'll give you some quick demos and quick entries into what uh, are some of the capabilities at Cybers, particularly the ones that you'd start out with using uh, I'll comment uh, very quickly that all of this stuff is on our learning center, uh, and I'll give you the address for that so that you can follow uh, and follow up. And of course, this will be recorded. And again, we'll be looking for any questions that you have, and I'll, we'll have time for you to answer those. Uh, but certainly getting data into Cybers is probably the first thing you might want to do if you're a user. Uh, you can store any type of file related to research. It moves seamlessly between the different platforms. Uh, you can certainly automate it and script against it, and it's great for sharing files with lab members, collaborators, and communities. There are a number of entry points. Uh, I'm going to cover all three because uh, they won't take too long to show you how they work. There are point and click methods, so CyberDuck, which is a standalone third-party software, uh, followed by the Discover environment, which I think I'll show you last, which is great for sharing, and then also iCommands, which is our automated um, more command line way to have access. Um, there are some pluses and minuses to each one of them. Uh, the discovery environment, really I've focused on that for sharing. It's a web-based interface, so we don't want to transfer uh, large files over HTTP. It's not robust, it's slow, it can break, um, but it does exist. Uh, and for small transactions, but really focus on that for sharing uh, with your colleagues. CyberDuck is really the no, uh, you don't have to think about it solution. Uh, simply download CyberDuck, and you can start uploading your data right away with a drag-and-drop GUI. 
And if you are comfortable on the command line, there's some simple sets of binaries that are compatible with our iBrod system called iCommands, which is also third-party software, and you can do uploads and downloads that way too. So let me quickly show you how that gets started. And I will mention to you that uh, here is the Cybers homepage at cybers.org. And if you go on the Cybers homepage and scroll down to the bottom, uh, I believe there's a link there to the Learning Center, which is also uh, learning. Whoops. Maybe they haven't switched this one over yet, or maybe it's two links before I get there. I'm just going to go ahead to learning.cybers.org. Uh, so learning.cybers.org. Uh, we're still adding uh, stuff to this all the time because we're transitioning our materials over to this read the box format. But essentially, the things that I'm going to talk to you about now, you can uh, get detailed information on using them. Uh, so the very first thing that I'm going to show you is just upload and download with uh, CyberDuck. So actually, if I click on the data store guide, and I talk about drag and drop data transfer with CyberDuck. Uh, this is available to anybody. Uh, you can click on the CyberDuck or you can go search for CyberDuck. And the thing here that you want to download is the configuration profile, which is just a bookmark for the Cyber's data store. Uh, CyberDuck is a third-party software. Uh, so you download it and then you only have this one-time authentication. So when you start it, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and open up Let's do it that way, new browser, get this out of the way. Uh, it looks something like this, where you have a, just a bookmark. Uh, the very first time you just enter your username and it can save your uh, Cyber's password. But then once you have uh, downloaded it, uh, this is what it looks like. It's connected right now and all of these files are files that are located within uh, the Cyber's data store. So if I wanna take something, looks like a simple text file and uh, if I'm good at dragging it, which I clearly wasn't there, if I'm good at dragging it uh, onto my desktop, it will go ahead and open up a dialog. And within a few seconds, uh, it, uh, after authentication, that might take a few moments to begin, but then it will go ahead and start the transfer. Uh, all the transfer speeds depend upon your connection. Uh, certainly international, uh, there may be a little bit of a uh, delay. Uh, we'd expect in the US, to move about 100 gigabytes of data into the Cyber's data store in about 30 minutes. So uh, the, the speeds really are fast, but there's always uh, bottlenecks and that's just true of any system. Uh, so this dialog box of transfers, again, when you first use it to authenticate, it may take a few seconds, but usually it's pretty fast uh, once the download actually starts. Uh, you have a record of all of your uploads and downloads and uploading a file would be the same thing there You could drag it onto the the cybers data store and the upload uh, would go ahead and resume uh, res Run from there you have history you can see what worked if something didn't work you can restart it um, But it's really just as simple as dragging and dropping That will go ahead and happen. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next demo uh, And I'll remind you that if you were back on learning here uh, learning.cybers.org, where it says command line transfer to iCommands. That would take you through how to go ahead and install iCommands on your system. Uh, it takes less than five minutes. Really, you just fill out this first uh, configuration uh, questions that it asks you when you initiate command. I, of course, already have iCommands installed. So I'm just going to go ahead and open up a terminal here. And then uh, once you have iCommands installed, uh, then you can use I commands and it's based on Linux. So it would be familiar to you if you've used Linux before. So in order to, to see the contents of your directory, it's not LS, but ILS. Uh, this is during a time, I guess, in the 2000s when putting an I in front of everything was popular. Um, but those are definitely files that are, uh, I just saw a moment ago in my uh, Cybers data store. If I want to move a file or a folder, uh, the I commands are specified here, so uh, to download something is called an iget. So if I want to do iget and recursive for a folder, I want to have the progress be verbose, softly set, and I do that for the ECS folder that I see in front of me. And I want to have that on my desktop, on my local system. I'll hit enter and I'll get a, a notification of what's going on. 
and it will go ahead and download those files. Uh, again, on an optimal connection, these can be extremely fast, uh, the way that you do the transfer. And now again, using I commands, of course, on my desktop, uh, you can see there's the folder of VCF, or whatever's in, uh, containing that folder. But you get the idea, uh, it can be extremely fast, and you can also write your own scripts in order to uh, move data. So uh, the last element that I'll talk about with, with uh, just intro to moving data is actually with data sharing. In order to do that, I'll come. Uh, this is also mentioned uh, in data sharing, I believe. Uh, so it gives you a quick run through of that. I'm going to go ahead and open up the discovery environment. Uh, so this is the discovery environment. I'm going to talk more about it as an analysis platform in just a moment. Um, but it is a web-based uh, interface to the data and the tools. If I click on data, I'm going to be presented with a window, so it's kind of like a virtual desktop. And then in my home folder is, well, that's my name. And then here again are all of the full files and folders that I saw just a few moments ago. If I check on any, uh, select any given file, uh, I can see information about when that file was created. I have an idea of what type of file it is. Uh, it's a bash file. If it's shared with anything, permissions, if I have tags associated to it, et cetera. Uh, I have all of those things available to me. So what I'll quickly talk about is how to share data. So there's two really quick ways to share data uh, within the Cybers ecosystem. Uh, one, I can click on any given file. This doesn't work with folders, but with files. And I can just say, I want to share it. So I can go to share and say, create a public link. And I can say, create. And this is just a quick way. If I have a, sm a small file, I wouldn't want to share multi-gigabyte files. But if I have a uh, small file I want to share, I can go ahead and show that link and copy it and, you know, include that in an email. Usually I share PowerPoint slides. Whoever has that URL can go ahead and, and download. They don't need to have a Cybers account at all. And there you go. Uh, they can go ahead and download that. Now, this is not secure uh, because you don't know anybody could have the link, right? So you wouldn't want to share secure data that way. Uh, when you do share it with somebody, you could also come back here and you could click the little uh, delete button next to that link. That link would no longer be active. So somebody who tried to download it again, uh, they would find that the link would be disabled for them. Uh, so you have that ability to have at least to that much control over it. Uh, more important though is uh, sharing large data sets. And this is one thing that Cyverse makes extremely easy. Uh, it, this does require that the other person has a Cyverse account. And it could be for individual files, or it could be for folders. So let's say I had um, a folder uh, that had something I wanted to share. I can check on that. And I can go up to share and say share with collaborators. Now, at this point, I need to decide who to share with. This is already shared with somebody. Um, but I can also type in the name of any other uh, Cybers user. And as I start typing in, I can find their name and their institution, so I'm pretty sure it's them. And then I can decide what level of permissions I'd like to share it with. Uh, if you're familiar with Unix permissions, then you pretty much understand it. If you go back to the guide, it'll tell you um, that read permission just allows me to read and perhaps download a file and view the metadata. And own is the highest level, including renaming, moving, deleting, so you want to be careful uh, only to give that to someone you really trust. Uh, but essentially, uh, if I decide to, to share that, I would click done, which I'm not going to do now. Um, and that person would get a notification literally within seconds uh, that that data set is available for them. What that means is that if I have, uh, you know, one terabyte data set and I find someone else I, I want to share it with, I can give fine grain, you know, folder by folder uh, permission control to anybody on the Cybers network. They instantly have it and are able to compute on it. Uh, so the, the pain of, of upload only has to be suffered uh, once. Once that is uh, being shared, uh, it'll appear in the shared with me folder. You all have a shared with me folder once you activate your account. There are some data sets and things that are shared with everyone during that uh, through that way, uh, but you get the idea that that's available. Um, and you can also go back to something that has been shared and you can adjust those permissions or you can revoke the sharing by deleting the person's name from the access. There's a whole bunch of other features I unfortunately just don't have time to show you. One of the best features is the metadata. So um, one of the things about file naming, 
let me just give you one quick example, uh, is that uh, you can only get so much out of a file name. You really need to have uh, metadata. I switched there too fast here on my internet, so it gave me a little bit of warning, which doesn't matter. Close that. Um, if I yeah, just take a look and see, I have an example of uh, one of the pipelines that we have is a pipeline for submitting your data automatically to the sequence read archive. Uh, so check out the quick start uh, or the tutorial. I think that's a quick, probably it's a quick start uh, on the learning.cybers.org. Uh, but when you submit the data, you need to submit all the metadata. So rather than having that just sort of sitting in a separate file, uh, the, the metadata is really seamless with Cyber. So if I click on an individual folder that has been marked up, and I believe since this is a demo one, uh, these all have some metadata attached to them. So if I go to metadata and edit view, what will happen is I will see all of the metadata attached to that particular file. And this one, input fast to files. Let's see if this is which one of these is actually marked up. Because I think it's one of them, but I have to uncheck the other one. Did not check this before I, uh, yeah. You can, you can essentially either use arbitrary metadata, um, but if you notice, or if you've done this before, these are all metadata fields that are required by NCBI. So we do have various templates. You could either use your own template or use it, you know, however you want to describe it, uh, but using that attribute value unit system, uh, you can mark up files with metadata, and then uh, the result of that is that you have powerful search. So if I go to search, and I want to have search terms, you know, uh, file name contains, and I can go ahead uh, and search and and decide how I want to uh, how do I want to search for something. I'm not going to do that now, uh, but you get the idea that you can. Um, you can go in and you can do uh, various powerful searches of multiple uh, multiple characters that you might want to search on, uh, multiple fields. All right, um, but I, I, I said I wasn't going to show it to you, and I've only shown you just the tip of it, um, but just give you an idea that there are some really nice features there when you mark up your data and you can learn more. Okay, so the next thing I have to talk about uh, is actually doing an analysis using the discovery environment. Let me go back to my slides for just a second. Okay, uh, so we'll talk about the discovery environment. As you said, it's a platform. It's, uh, you can run almost any type of bioinformatics application that you normally run at the command line, uh, essentially putting it in the wrapper. Uh, it's integrated with the data and high performance computing and it's user extensible, although we won't add applications right now or get a sense of it. You've already seen data, so that's the upload, download files, those folders. Uh, there's some other features there in those menus I haven't gone through. Uh, but most of it's self-explanatory. The applications, which we're going to go to now, where you can see the applications that exist, and also analyses where you can see the status and also the history of your applications. So I'll do a quick demo, uh, which I'll use a, a program called Muscle to just align some sequences. I usually use that because it's quick uh, and fairly simple, um, but gives you a sense of how things work. Uh, so within apps, I can go to Applications. And I have a listing of all the applications uh, that are there. And my apps are apps under development, things I've edited. Uh, but you can search by topic or operation. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I need to authenticate, it says, because I clicked on HPC. Uh, but I'll go ahead and just type in muscle. Oh, it's making me authenticate since I did say yes to that. This is a one-time thing. So we do have a variety of HPC apps for things like genome assembly, uh, where you can run uh, some of these longer run time, 24 hour, 48 hour run uh, HPC things that are quite intensive. Uh, usually you have to talk to us first. We wanna make sure that they're, they're being appropriately used. All right, now I can go back and just search for Muscle, which is the app that I wanted to use. Um, as not an aside, but in the background, uh, these applications are all sitting in Docker images. So essentially, if you want an application and you want to add something that is not currently in our list, uh, you can build a wrapper for it and uh, you can give us a Docker file or a link to binary and we can 
have a container where we're running. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and click on an app. When you click on an app, uh, these little dots give you some app info. Uh, so a brief synopsis of the app and maybe a link to the user manual. You can see how many times people have used it and when's the last time it's being used. Uh, since apps are really community contributed, um, you may want to make use of seeing you know, that it seems to be working for other people. Uh, but when I click on any app, uh, it essentially loads a window that looks like this. doesn't matter what the app is. I have a name, uh, so I'm going to call this Muscle for Amble ABR Demo. And I'll give it a comment. Uh, it's really good to be in the habit of documenting things. Since we're using a GUI, uh, it's harder to keep track of what you've done when you're just clicking buttons versus having a script in front of you. Uh, so we do like to document. I am going to go ahead and choose uh, Cyverse Training. I see it opened up in the last place that I started with. And actually, let me go this, this way. Just want to take a FASTA file that we can align. One second. I'll do it from here. Samples. I was expecting to be some something somewhere it wasn't what I was expecting to be. There we go. Should have looked in my favorites in the beginning. The walkthrough, and I'm just going to choose a FASTA file that we can align. So it's only got one input, this FASTA file. And the sequence type, uh, you really have this sort of accordion menu where you flip through all of the options, which normally would have been presented the command line. I'll click Launch Analysis, and uh, that will go ahead and launch. I'll get a notification that it's launched. And I will go ahead. Uh, by the way, uh, point out some other features while we're waiting for that to uh, to run. On the bottom right hand side uh, of the window here is this little uh, intercom icon. So if you have uh, questions and you need help, uh, we do have support team where you can start a live conversation depending if it's on working hours uh, for the folks in Arizona. But you can go ahead and either search for a question or you can go ahead and leave your question there and someone will get back to you if it's not during the live hours. Okay, the other piece that's here is the analyses where I can see what I've done and the history of it and the status of things. So uh, here is my, here are jobs that I've run in the past. And if I click on any given job, uh, I can check it off and go to analyses and say view parameters. And here I get a simple uh, idea of what I use. This only had one parameter like FASTQC, so I can see what file was the input. I can click on that file and it'll take me to the location in the data store that's located. If I go back and look for an application um, that is more complex, uh, that may have had more uh, features in it. Let's see. Looks like I did something with Callisto. I can go to view parameters of that. And yeah, I can see all of the inputs. I can see anything that I selected. So these can be saved or exported as simple text files. So you have a record of all the stuff that you've done. All right, let me go ahead and click refresh. I know it'll take a second to complete, but I want to wait. Uh, it's done. Uh, so it gives me the status of completed. And if I click on the name, uh, I will go ahead and be able to uh, see the results. And here are my align sequences. So it's really a pretty friendly uh, system for anybody that's uh, used to working with a GUI. One last thing, I, I think I'll take about five minutes, well, less than five minutes, I hope, uh, just to show you this new thing that we've rolled out called Vice. And then I will also move on to our last product, Atmosphere, so that we have time at the end uh, for questions. Um, but let me see, I guess I have slides for it. I won't want to uh, go off track.
Uh, good. Oh, good. That's the next slide. Perfect. Uh, so we have just rolled out our implementation of what we call in visual and interactive computing environment. Uh, it really just came out. Really is public. Uh, there's so many good features about it. Uh, we'll probably have we we have a webinar just on that, uh, which is on our YouTube channel. And we're doing more, uh, but it's really flexible implementation of Jupyter Labs, R Studio, and R Shiny. Uh, and it's really, uh, if you do have some skills working with the command line, uh, it's a very flexible way to go ahead and customize what we built. Uh, so I'll give you a quick example of this. Uh, what you would do in order to use Vice uh, is you could go, uh, we may have uh, future different interfaces for it, but for right now, what you do is you go into applications and you can search, let's say for Jupyter, uh, to find the Jupyter Labs. And I can go ahead and click on Jupyter Lab. And I would launch this, but I would also launch it and I would uh, explicitly add folders or files, notebooks, whatever it is that I want to be part of this environment. So we're launching uh, an individual container, a Docker uh, container. In fact, you can customize it or you can give us a Docker file with what you'd like to be in it on launch. So you can really customize this. But again, it's all gonna run on our system. Um, you would run the application in a few moments, you get a link such as I have here. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and launch, I think the one that I'd like, uh, which has uh, not been configured. So let's open this up. It's essentially blank, but it'll have Jupyter Lab running on it. So I need to give it a moment to start. And uh, the use case that I'll talk about right now is I have this folder that I started it with that has some input, which is essentially, I think, a FASTQ file. Um, so this SRR1008 FASTQ probably haven't install, installed any Jupyter extensions because they do have extensions for looking at files like this. Uh, I'm going to close it. Um, but let's say that FASTQC was not installed on my on, in, in the cybers uh, discovery environment. Let's see how good I am. Uh, I could start a terminal. I love doing a live demo. I could go ahead and start a terminal. And if this one doesn't, yeah, there we go. Uh, and I could do, I could work with Conda to install that. So I could say Conda, uh, and then I wanna do add, oops, I think it's this add channel. If I've got that right. Oops, let's go ahead and actually look up what I'm doing since I imagine on, uh, I imagine that on uh, in a completely jet lag state. Yeah, conda config, oops, I'm missing up all of my package manager uh, parlance here. We want to add bioconda as a, uh, as a channel and then I could say conda install uh, fast QC because let's say it wasn't installed in Cybers, I couldn't find it. Um, but then you'd go through the process there of installing that. Uh, I'll give it 10 seconds. I doubt it will finish it in 10 seconds, but it won't take 10 minutes uh, to go ahead and install that. What I'll do instead is uh, just sort of prove my point. Uh, once I install a tool in that vice environment, uh, let's open up one that I have already running and started to configure. I installed it, and then I started a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, so if I go back, and here's my untitled notebook, I could just go back, and as you see here, once I was able to install it, I just ran a Jupyter Magic uh, FastQC command, uh, ran the FastQ file, and then in my uh, output for that, there's an HTML file, oops, which I should actually open. Uh, I could download it. I haven't installed the, uh, any other thing that would allow me to view it, but you could uh, find a Jupyter Lab extension. But now here's my result. Uh, so the point is, and now this other one that I left running, but still solving, thank you, Conda, but it will, it will go ahead and do it. You get the idea that uh, for any tool that you couldn't find, within a few minutes, uh, you don't have to wait for us to install it because normally when you give us a Docker file, uh, we do have to 
uh, do some things to get that running for you, uh, you have a lot more flexibility to run some of those things. And there are going to be a lot of cool use cases that we uh, hope to show off for folks wanting to use that. And you could also last launch your R Shiny apps and your uh, R Studio sessions. And you sort of get the idea that you have a really fully featured workbench for doing your uh, science right within a self-contained um, platform that handles the data storage and all those other things. Uh, one last thing that I have time for, if I'm going to finish, let's say, in the next four minutes, uh, five minutes, is Atmosphere, which is another big piece of the infrastructure, our cloud system. So let me go back to the slides and quickly introduce that. And then just show you, uh, give you a taste of what that does. Uh, so Atmosphere is our cloud uh, instance, which I think and hope that many of you are familiar with the wonderful uh, resources that you have uh, in Australia uh, from the vir genomics virtual lab and Nectar and all those things like that. So similar idea. Uh, it's just integrated with our system. Uh, I, get, I hope you have the idea of what an image is. So you, uh, if you've taken a computer and made a, a backup where you want to restore that whole uh, computer, that's called an image. You, normal files, if you put them on a uh, hard, dri hard drive, uh, they come off as normal files, but an image file can actually uh, recreate an entire system. So we have a variety of images that you could use, uh, ones that we provided, or you can image your own. And in our cloud, we have a number of physical resources, so you need to specify what you'd like from us. And you put that with an image, and then you get your virtual machine, which is available to you within a few minutes from an IP address. And we've been doing this really for years, uh, before even Amazon was cool. Uh, we certainly were providing this to the life sciences. Uh, and there's even a bigger project called Jetstream, uh, which is NSF funded, which builds on this work. Uh, but it's a really nice solution that you could have access to potentially, uh, and a lot of use cases. So to quickly show that and then uh, see where we're at with questions, uh, I can go to Atmosphere. Uh, so when you log into Atmosphere, you do need to request access to this. Uh, it's not an automatic part of your account, and again, uh, there may be some restrictions uh, for international users, but uh, please let us know. We do want to try to make it as easy as possible. Uh, you can log in and you can see what you're using currently and the history of what you used before. Uh, you can click on images and you can look and see what images community members have made available. We certainly make a number of base images available, so basic you know, Ubuntu machines that you can go ahead and customize, um, but also uh, community members uh, install images with different tools, and you can go ahead and take a look and see uh, what's in there and what's available and what's it's described. You can also form projects where you uh, mix your image along with some type of persistent storage that's custom uh, so that you don't have to transfer data in all the time, although you can transfer data in and out. There's no egress charge. It's all on our cloud, and it's quite fast. But I have a project here called Demo. Um, but if I want to go ahead and launch an instance, I could say I want a new instance, and I could search by topic. You know, let's say I search for RNA seq, and I want to find out uh, images that might have tools that I'm interested in. So let's say yeah, I wanted to use Trinitate, uh, and I can then choose what size of an instance I want to launch, and I see my allocation that I'm allowed, and I click launch instance, and within a few minutes, I would have that available to me. Uh, here's an instance I launched before the webinar, and I can see the status of it, as well as an IP address, and the number of ways I can connect really easily. I can just go ahead and click on Web Shell, and through the web, I will have an interface uh, to my instance. So, oh, I clicked on the web uh, desktop, which is fine. Uh, so this will be a visual interface, since this has happened to have a desktop, and perhaps I have a GUI. Uh, that I couldn't run otherwise, and so I could run that on my desktop system like that. If I click on, there's Windows in my way, if I click on Web Shell this time, I would be able to access it via the shell, which is what I thought I clicked before, and I'm on that same instance uh, that I have access to and could do whatever I'd like to. Uh, and of course, if I go back and I have the IP address, I can copy that IP address, and then in my terminal, I can uh, SSH in my cybers username at that IP address and my cybers credentials. 
and I would have, I think I typed them wrong, by the way. Okay, there we go. Did I do better this time? Yes, and I'm uh, on my Atmosphere instance uh, and able to do what I need. Uh, so it's really, really easy, and I can also move data back and forth uh, pretty seamlessly. I can make a new image if I've reconfigured it. I can pause it if I'm not using it, and of course I can delete it uh, when I'm done, and be careful about that because we won't be able to store anything from an image that's been deleted without being saved. So that is a really broad and extensive overview. Um, in terms of slides, uh, last things I'll say is to check out the Learning Center uh, for tutorials that we have there and also things that are upcoming. We do workshops and webinars and would love to uh, certainly be able to provide more uh, that people like from us and also uh, shout out to uh, the executive team. And with that, uh, I think I am uh, good for my presentation. I hope that I encouraged you to take a look at some of the things we have to offer, and I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you. Thanks very much, Jason. Um, we have a, a few questions here. Uh, first, an atmosphere-related question from Christopher Alboni. Does sure. or will atmosphere support GPU-enabled clouds? So I don't know the answer to that this second. I do know that we are very much interested in providing GPU support, both in the discovery environment, um, which then you could access um, that way, and within Atmosphere. I don't know the current plans for that, but if you uh, want to send, shoot us an email or just log on to any cyber system and click the intercom button, someone can get back to you for that. It may also be through the Jetstream system, but definitely people are aware of the increasing value of GPU computing, and I think that they would be interested in, in providing that to you in some way. And if the answer is no, uh, but you have a great use case, then maybe they, we can make the answer yes. Great, thanks. Uh, we have a new user question from Peter Noyce. Um, Peter says, I'm a plant biologist with nil training of skills in computer programming. Can I use Cyverse to analyze my RNA-seq data using software in R, Python, et cetera, without knowing how to run them? Um, that is a trick question. Uh, so yes, you can. Uh, in fact, actually, we have a version of the, the classroom tool that we use called DNA Subway, which actually implements uh, Callisto and Sleuth uh, you know, for RNA-seq. Uh, is part, I don't know if the Caliso workflow is up yet. It will be in the next uh, week or two, I think. Um, yes, you can do that. In fact, in, in the discovery environment, we have uh, many RNA-seq tools. Uh, my only caution is just uh, that you don't want to use a tool without knowing how it works. But uh, that aside, we can make it easy for you to use the tool. Uh, so I, I, I think that's exactly what we had in mind to enable biologists who didn't come uh, out of school with those skills. And so it's a great way to get started and you can go into DE definitely and start using them. And there's some tutorials that will help you. There's an RNAC tutorial uh, that's there. So try them out and let us know how we can help you with that. But it is possible. But do uh, make sure you invest in learning something about how the tools work because there's so many assumptions about an RNA-seq experiment. You want to get them right so that you know you have confidence in your result. Um, Evan Thomas has asked, how does Cyverse compare to Galaxy? Sure. Uh, so the way that Galaxy was originally designed was constructed to be able to have everyone set up their own Galaxy. Um, that has happened over the years that there are now many publicly available instances. And in fact, Galaxy Main runs on Cybers. Uh, so it's enabled by Cybers. Uh, and you can actually launch Galaxy through this environment that I just showed you, Vice. Um, so the difference is that Galaxy is more of a, a, a wrapper and interface. But Cybers is really a whole technology stack uh, that allows you to do the whole thing. So you don't have to install your own uh, Galaxy at your own system, you can use ours. There's a pluses and minuses to that. The other thing that I think uh, Cybers does is when you have lar much larger data sets and you need to really scale to now HPC level, that's something that you would start to hit walls with with Galaxy. So there are some things that are 
a little bit harder to use within Cybers, but they're there and they can help people who want to scale to higher level. Thanks. So Andrew Trelaw has asked quite a few questions, um, but I'm just going to choose one because we're getting getting a bit short on time. Um, how applicable is the Cybers infrastructure outside the life sciences? Uh, we do actually have people using it in astronomy. Uh, we have people using it in, the, in more of the health sciences, uh, life sciences. Uh, we, we think of ourselves usually as basic researchers. Uh, so there are people using it. Uh, really, the, there's nothing too much that's life science specific. You could load up your files. Uh, you could launch your Jupyter Lab. You could install your tools. Uh, so there are definitely publications and people using it outside of the life sciences. It's not the feature that we spend our time advertising, uh, but it's actually possible. And certainly, we'd love to encourage people to come up with interesting use cases. Yeah, great. Um, so. Final question from Richard Tillett at the University of Nevada, Reno. He's um, written quite a long question, which I'll try and summarise. Hopefully I get it right, Richard. Um, so Richard is, has an um, upcoming training event uh, at, on his campus, um, their first data carpentry event, and they're going to be able to use Atmosphere and other cyber services for that whole training. Um, and he's asking, should he encourage the students to think about cyber and atmosphere as a resource they can and should use beyond the workshop and for their future yes. research. Is it yeah, responsible have, for, for him to encourage yeah. that? Probably the majority of signups every month are undergraduate students and graduate students. Uh, so students, students are a big driver of, the, of who signs up and who uses the platform. We absolutely want students to continue using it, um, whatever their entry point. As they grow as researchers, uh, they'll make more sophisticated use of the platform. So we totally support that. I, I often have taught myself carpentry workshops using Atmosphere. So please do, everyone can sign up for their own account. Great, okay, I think I'll, I'll share my um, screen again for the last few slides for today. But thank you again, Jason, for a fantastic <laughs> yet brief overview of some of, just some of the functionality of um, Cyverse. Um, oh. uh, so thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have any suggestions for future webinar topics or speakers, please feel free to send us an email um, at the webinar's address at the bottom of my screen. Um, you can see our webinar schedule for 2019 on our website and access registration links as they become available. We've got some exciting webinars coming up already um, and the first one will hopefully be from Simon Steele, the director of the National Centre for Indigenous Genomics, um, based at ANU, who will speak about da data custodianship in this project. So thanks again for making time to attend and present the webinar today. Um, it's been recorded and this, the recording will be available next week as well as Jason's slides. Um, we'll, we'll send an email to all of you with the links, uh, plus the links for um, further investigation about cybers. So finally, um, ABR would like to acknowledge funding from Bioplatforms Australia and the University of Melbourne, and ARDC would like to acknowledge funding from NCRIS. As the webinar closes, there'll be a short survey, and it will only take a minute or so, so um, please fill it in. It'll help us with our future planning. Thanks again, and goodbye, everyone. <laughs>